This week I'm joined once again by writer and occultist John Michael Greer. He has written multiple books on societal, economic and natural collapse, including The Long Descent, Dark Age America and Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush. In this special episode we discuss COVID-19, the coronavirus and its implications on the future. If you wish to support Hermetic's podcast, please find our donation, merchandise and Patreon links in the description below. Enjoy. Uh, John Michael Greer, thanks uh, for coming on Hermetics uh, for the fourth time for this sort of emergency pandemic special. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on again. I always enjoy these shows. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to say here is I will allow you publicly to say I told you so to uh, everyone <laughs> everyone listening. As a world-renowned societal collapse expert, I think I think it's deserved. Uh, <laughs> But so yeah, we're in the we're in the midst of uh, coronavirus, mm-hmm. COVID nineteen, and I mm-hmm. think to you know I'm I'm an avid reader of yours and I'm an avid follower of Dmitry Orlov and James Kunstler and uh, Chris Martinson. So so just you know I I hope it's not too arrogant to say this isn't what's happening here isn't too much of a surprise. Of course, a biological thing such as Corona is uh, sort of is a you know not an anomaly, but you you can't work it out. So we'll start here. What's it? What's it looking like where you are? You're in the Appalachian, small Appalachian no, mining I, town. Actually, no, 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 no. These days, these days, I live in East Providence, Rhode Island. Ah, okay. We've, we've, yeah, we've left, we've left the mountains and are now on the sea coast, but it amounts to much the same thing. Um, East Providence is an old factory town. It's, um, of course, it's kind of a, a suburb of Providence itself, which is a small, a smallish East Coast city. Mm-hmm. Um, what it looks like here is is a, a kind of a slightly quieter version of business as usual. Um, this uh, East Providence is not large enough to have to have a, a shelter in place order. They haven't locked down the city. They are, you know, they're. They've uh, banned lar- any large gatherings <clears throat> to um, take out, to get restaurant takeout food instead of sitting in. There are some other things that have shut down and so on mm-hmm. in order to make sure that, um, that the virus doesn't spread any faster than it has to. Um, but I mean, the stores are still open and everything. It's, so things, are, things, things seem to be going here as in most smaller communities in the, in the United States. Um, everyone's just kind of taking it in stride. Okay, so as as someone who's written, um, I probably, I, you know, I can't tally tally up the books. I've, I, mean, I know you've written forty books on occultism and collapse. I'm not sure how many specifically on collapse, but you you're a world renowned, extremely prolific writer on collapse. And I, from mm-hmm. from the few from from sorry not the few the many that I've read, I can't remember too many specific bits about you know a, a biological things such as this specifically because I don't mm-hmm. think that's your focus. Your focus is on the overarching ignorance as far as far as i can see of of the assumptions we've made prior to these things mm-hmm. happening mm-hmm. so as soon as this sort of began to spiral and, and it was clear that it wasn't sars or mrsa again and this was something that's sort of i mean if you think it is something that's a bit larger than this is this unfolding in a way that you anticipated Yes, and in fact, I did, I did in a couple, of my, a couple of my books and a number of blog posts, I discussed the likelihood that we would be seeing more pandemics, more major diseases, uh, a general decline in public health. So this is, this is totally predictable. It's, all, it's simply normal when you have um, a community of any kind of living things. Um, new microbes will get into the population at intervals. If anything, we're, we're lucky. We have lucked out because this has a relatively mild death rate. Three, I mean, three to four percent, uh, depending on where you are. Italy and is this ten, is one of, I believe. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into the complexities because there are some there are some very interesting variations in um, in death rates and and a number of other factors going on here. But one way or another, you know, it's not it's not even it's not the Spanish flu. We're not looking at a ten to twenty percent death rate. Mm-hmm. much less, say, pneumonic plague. Mm-hmm. Um, we could have gotten hit by something much harder. Now, the good side of that, well, I mean, other than the fact that um, a, lot of, a lot of people who would, might die in a you know, more serious epidemic will um, you know, get sick and then get better. Um, the great thing about this is that we have a chance to see our vulnerabilities. We have a chance to realize, oops, we cannot rely on all of these systems remaining exactly in place. And so I've been hearing from a lot of folks readers of mine and so on who are going oh so this is what you're talking about gotcha 
And, and, it's, and it's great because, you know, everyone has a chance to go through that period of disorientation, to let themselves be scared, to, to be aware of how vulnerable they are, how vulnerable the systems that, that support our daily lives are. And then we can do something about it. Mm-hmm. And so when the next crisis comes, and of course there will be a next crisis, when the next crisis comes, we'll be better prepared because it won't be striking us out of the blue. It will be, okay, here we go again. And that, again, is a very useful thing. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that's interesting you say that because you're a, I, I'm not sure if you still identify the, as this politically, but you're a Burkean conservative, which is based... I, I'm a moderate, I'm a moderate Burkean conservative, which is correct. Which, as far as I understand it, is someone who says, we'll look at history and see if it worked. If it did, then we'll we'll do it again. If it didn't, then either we tweak it or we don't do it. So Exactly. So your hope here is that we learn from this, which, as far as I'm concerned, as the pessimist in me is concerned, we don't <laughs> learn from history. So when you say, this, this will happen again, uh, I'd like to think we'll mm-hmm. learn, but I, I just... Well, it depend, now, now the, the, the crucial thing here is who's doing the learning. Uh, does humanity mm-hmm. as a whole learn the lessons of history? Of course not. Um, there, there, is, there seems to be a law of, of, of intelligence in groups. The more people you put together, you, you like have to divide the, intelli- the total intelligence, the average intelligence by the number of people in the group or, or something mm-hmm. like that. Because mm-hmm. people in masses are dumber than rocks. Individuals can learn. Mm-hmm. And that's my hope, is that individuals looking at this will go, oh, okay, now I understand what that crazy archdrude was talking about, mm-hmm. and I won't be caught quite so cluelessly again the next time something like this happens. And that, that, cause that's the way any real change happens. It happens because individuals figure out something, and they get hit over the head by what, what, what the kids online these days call a clue by four, mm-hmm. um, often enough, and all of a sudden it's, Oh, okay, and then they change their ways. That's what I'm hoping for. Will society as a whole, you know, wake up and get a clue? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Our species doesn't do that. So I'm just going to go back to something you said there, because um, for some people that might not understand this, you have a background in ecology, um, mm-hmm. which mixed with a sort of, shall we say, esoteric reactionary nature mixes into mm. sort of a uh, a hop of of admitting things which people even people in the hard scientists sciences are, are now reluctant to admit because of certain things now you said that it's sort of a it, well it is inevitable that mm-hmm. that uh, bugs and viruses such as this will arise out mm-hmm. of um, large communities of animals of species mm-hmm. Um in what way, in terms of ecology and nature, as you understand it, is, is that an inevitability? Okay. Um, basically, every living, every living organism is constantly, so to, so to speak, testing the edges of its, of its habitat. Is there's, always, there, you know, there's always more people there are more, or more viruses or more um, chipmunks or what have you. There are more critters than there is habitat, and so you always have this constant outward pressure looking for some new way to make a living. And that's something you especially see in the world of microbes, where you have the, I mean, probably most of the, by weight, most of the life on this planet consists of single-celled organisms even today. Mm-hmm. And so there's vast numbers of them. They're constantly pressing on the boundaries of their habitats. They're looking for new things, new ways to get by, new opportunities to, to evolve and expand. And in the meantime, you also have the genetic processes that sort of keep the genome constantly shifting, constantly changing. And that's, that's normal. That's, that's what drives evolution. That combination of constant outward pressure, constantly changing um, genomes, and environmental constraints. And so because, because that's happening, at every moment, new organisms, new microbes, are evolving the different capacities. And by the simple luck of the draw, new microbes are going to figure out how to get into um, a very, a very um, numerous species of organism that happens to be running around, namely us. We're food, as far as they're concerned. And so, you know, everyone's lining up at the restaurant hoping to get some human takeout. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and 
at regular intervals, they do so. I mean, we get a new flu virus every single year, and it is actually a different virus. The viruses change, they mm-hmm. mutate. That's why you have to get the, that's why the, the, um, the doctors have different shots, not all of which work, um, for each season's flu, because it's always new. And in the same way, although over a longer time span, you constantly have new viruses that are, and new, new microbes, other kinds, that are pressing on the limits of their habitat and make the jump to human beings. And sometimes you have, the, you have that, and it's something that kills people very quickly, like SARS. Okay? So it can be shot down very, very rapidly. You, you know who's sick. That's not a problem. In this case, a coronavirus, probably originally um, found in bats, was able to make the jump to human beings. Now, coronaviruses are very common among human beings. A lot of what causes the common cold are a set of coronaviruses that have long since been established in your nose and mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so this was was a virus of a a familiar type, a virus of a kind that, that does well with that sort of upper respiratory transmission. And so it got into the human, in, in, into the, the, the stock of human beings uh, by way of uh, apparently a meat market in Wuhan, China, and went, woohoo, I can, I can do this. And so here it is. And the thing is, again, this kind of thing happens all the time. Every few years, we have a new virus coming into the, to circulation, I mean, even leaving aside like flu viruses and so on. But every few, few years, we have a novel virus that finds some way into the human population, and maybe it kills a few people, and maybe it kills a lot of people, and maybe it just makes some people ill. It, just, it depends on, on the luck of the genetic draw. But it's a constant process. It's something that has always gone on and, and presumably always will go on. Mm-hmm. Now it's interesting that you, that you you brought up the the key factors of I think why this is is scaring people. Now, as mm-hmm. far as I can see it, it's something we've spoken about before. As far as I can see it, the, the 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 actual reason that this is sort of terrifying to people isn't actually to do with the economic collapse. Isn't to do with instability or or this uncertainty that they're having. It's actually what people are beginning to see what is being revealed by these processes, which is death mm-hmm. and illness are still mm-hmm. real, even though they're covered, mm-hmm. even though they're one of the primary functions of society as a whole is, is to force the idea that these things no longer happen, they no longer exist. Painkillers for pain, death is hidden away, you know, you have no worries, mm-hmm. comfort time all the time. And this, this coronavirus, this mortality rate of just 3% is this sort mm-hmm. of stoic cynical cosmic reminder you know Mm -hmm. you you can Mm -hmm. die you are not you are not invulnerable not only can you die you will die (laughs) and you know nobody lives forever that's this is the the great lie of our society that and you see this in the medical profession so often well you know we can we can keep people from dying of this and we can keep people from dying of that we can keep people from dying of the other well what do you want them to die of because they're going to die Mm -hmm. we all you know none of us lives forever and so, yeah. This is so. This is a this is a very useful reminder of the fact that um, we have a you know our, we have a temporary lease on life in this world, and when it's up, it's up. And of course, that's freaking people out uh, because again, as you you know, as you mentioned, people like to like to pretend otherwise. They love they love to believe that it doesn't matter. It can't happen. So yeah, that's one of the major things that's scaring people. Also, though. Um, there's simply the fact that um, this, unlike some illnesses, this one transmits very well without you knowing it. Mm-hmm. People can be dripping viruses from every pore and look perfectly healthy. Mm-hmm. And so that's producing the, the sort of terror reaction. And it's also, it's also revealing things like um, some of the limitations on our, uh, on our economic system, not in terms of economic collapse, but in terms of, say, toilet paper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this was, this was one of, the, one, the, one of the, the key things I've got written down here, because the toilet paper is an interesting one. As I understand it, the, the two facts I've got on this is either, uh, let's just be, not beat around the bush here, either diarrhea isn't really a symptom of this bug, or only 10% of people get it, which to me... Mm-hmm means the toilet paper thing brings to the fore one of the key sort of problems and mentalities of, of, of the day, which is mimicry or mimetics or sort of copying mm-hmm. or herd think. Because ultimately, mm-hmm. the, the you, no one needs the 
the toilet paper. There is enough to go around, but no one actually needs it for the purposes they're buying it. What happened was one person bought it and, you know. So this is this is what is, as far as I can see, fueling the, the panic, which is just mm-hmm. mimicry. Mm-hmm. Uh, mimicry and then the the awkward reality that if you don't join the panic you might not be able, you, you may run out of toilet paper mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you have it it becomes kind of a prisoner's dilemma do you join do you join the panic and feed it or do you um sit back and go i don't care and then you have to like find some other way to clean yourself after you use the toilet um Mm-hmm. So, I mean, for that, that was why. I mean, we didn't put, we didn't go whole hog, but I did pick up a couple of extra extra packages, and the stores, um, the local stores, are fairly short on to, on toilet paper at this point. Yeah, we're we're fairly short, but and I did the same thing, but but uh, um, you know, I don't I don't want to put myself outside of the the herd because I I did exactly what I believe most people are doing. I believe there's let's say if there's a hundred people, there's only three or four who are actually panic buying. The problem is there's another twenty in the store who see that. And mm-hmm. like you yeah. said, it's sort of a status thing. You know, you don't want to get mm-hmm. caught yeah. out. You don't want to be you don't want to be the one who doesn't get it. But um exactly. this, this does bring me through to another thing. I mean, this might be a, a lot of people's introduction to your work, you know, a world collapse expert on, on a current collapse. Um so brings me through to the, the mentality of, of, of prepping and uh, stockpiling mm-hmm. and you know people uh, we've spoken before about this and you've always the practical advice of uh, people always ask how many uh, cans of gherkins do I need to buy and then you know <laughs> well how many do you normally eat none right you need none and when I go to the stores I see the, the shelves that are run out a lot of the ones I expected, but also a lot of strange ones. Pasta sauce, microwavable rice, things which are just very odd to me. Now, mm-hmm. what do you make of this sort of strange, sudden prepping mentality? It's, 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 it is really odd. It is really odd because I think to some extent the, the prepper movement has been successful in getting the idea out into circulation that one of the things you can that, that will help you weather ordinary the, the ordinary ups and downs of life is a cupboard or two full of food. Mm-hmm. And, and of course they're quite right. But of course then people get panicky, they don't necessarily think clearly. Um, the, here, here for example, the, the grocery, one of the grocery stores where I routinely shop, all of the containers of broth, there's this shelf of various soup broth, okay? This, and they, they, people just cleaned it out. Mm-hmm. I have no idea why. <laughs> and, but things, things will happen that way. Again, we, you know, it, it is heard to think. We, we, one of the things this is, this is very usefully reminding us is that we are not really rational beings. I mean, most of us under some circumstances when we're calm and not particularly um, threatened by anything, we can think rationally. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't come. It doesn't come naturally. It's not something that happens automatically. And you put any pressure on most people, and the rational mind just shuts down, and they do some very strange things, like running around buying microwavable rice or something like that. Uh, so, I think I think that's that's a lot of it. One one good thing that could come of this is that people may, after you know the the whole thing is over, um, take a look at what they bought. Say, what am I going to do with all those cans of gherkins? <laughs> and, and think about putting, you know, putting by a stash of things they actually eat. Mm-hmm. You know, filling, filling up a cupboard and and rotating in and out, and just having that little bit of cushion to keep them going when the next crisis shows up. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, this is, as far as I can see, entering us. I hope you know, like we said, um, I hope that individuals will learn from this i hope people will learn from this of course as you've mentioned the herd doesn't learn as a herd it's it's now there is a few things i've jotted down here that i believe hopefully i mean perhaps this is my own biases coming out here but hopefully uh, i believe will be increased or decreased and, and one of the ones is is actually a sort of less reliance or a inherent distrust of mega business of of supermarkets mm-hmm. of understanding that that because as far as i can see a lot of people you know, we're taught in schools um, always, always be thankful that water comes out of the tap and there's there's food on the on the shelves. And I don't believe we're actually taught that anymore. And I, I think for most people, um, 
food in the stores is is almost a right. It's it's a thing. Mm-hmm. It's a thing which is in the same way that a uh, you plant an acorn, a a, a a tree grows. You know, it's something that is a fact of living in the West. There is food in the shops, and mm-hmm. this is sort of Corona has has fractured the the dream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's making people actually aware that they they do need to think about where their food comes from. Um, over on this side of the pond, um, I've heard from a number of people who are involved in small farms and things like that, and it's really rather funny because they've been getting panicked calls from people, um, in, in sometimes from some distance away, who want to know if they you know what are they growing, what do they have, what kind of food do they have. It's March. Come on. <laughs> the sea, in some areas, the seeds have just gone into the ground. In some areas, it's still too cold. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you don't... It, so it is. It, there's some learning that has to happen here, no question. But, but, yeah, people are beginning to become aware that they can't simply assume that these, these megastructures of everyday life are going to function as expected. And that's, that's very important. Once people get to the point of, of grasping the fragility of our existing systems, it becomes much easier to do things to make those systems less fragile, to promote local reliance rather than the, the sort of global megastructure that we're stuck with at the moment, and so on. Mm-hmm. Where do you think those assumptions come from? The, oh, the advertising. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nobody. I mean, nobody ever turned on the television and saw an advertisement of bare, with bare shelves saying, "We'll have more food in next week." <laughs> <laughs> so it's advertising on the one hand, and, and also since the Second World War, the the, the industrial world, the, the Western world, has had an extraordinary and historically very unusual period. Of, of stability and peace and prosperity. And we've, we've had economic downturns, sure, but compared to what has happened in the past, they've hardly been noticeable. Mm-hmm. And we haven't had, you know, we haven't, uh, since again, since the Second World War, we haven't had to deal with food rationing, we haven't had to deal with real shortages, we haven't had to deal with bombs dropping out of the sky or any of the other charming things that, that history is generally full of. Well, not necessarily bombs dropping out of the sky, but um, enemy horsemen stampeding through the gates works out of the same thing. Um, so basically, we've had that we've, we've, we've gotten lazy. Mm-hmm. We've gotten comfortable and cozy and, you know, thinking that everything's fine and nothing, nothing can really change. Um, do you, the, oh, Francis Fukuyama, who is hmm. Um, hmm. A, a source of endless amusement to me, okay. he's, he's, an Amer- he's an American intellectual who some years ago wrote a book on, announcing the, that history was over. <laughs> okay. Yeah. History's done history. with... The end of history, the end of history, because um, the, the, the whole point of history, you know, this is Hegel, and we'll, we can get to that in a bit, but the whole point of history is this, this sort of competition between governmental systems to determine which one is best. And with the defeat of the Soviet Union and the triumph of, of, um, the, of what we laughingly call liberal democracy, um, that, that, that is settled once and for all. There may be events, but everything is going to settle down into this nice, calm, stable afternoon where nothing much happens ever again. A lovely thesis. Uh, it, it, the thing is, it's, it was, it, it's perfect Hegel, which means... It, it, I don't know if you've ever read Hegel's philosophy of history. Um, unfortunately, I was more... I, was, I always diverted at Schopenhauer, and uh, the, oh, the, yeah. my favourite quote on Hegel is uh, from the philosopher Nick Land, which is, reading Hegel is brain cancer, which is one of my... <laughs> I will not argue. Um, um, so yeah, I think you know yeah. the the yeah. if we're talking, you know, for anyone who's not philo- philo- philosophy savvy, uh, antithesis, thesis, and then uh, a synthesis. So an uh-huh. agreement, a disagreement, and then we we have come to a compromise. Now, unfortunately, I think perhaps you'd agree with me here, John. Coronavirus is, is isn't part of that threefold structure. It's the di- exactly. it's the diagonal which it's history you know you're not immune to history it's history coming back yeah, exactly yeah the 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 problem with he- Hegel's theory of history always produces nonsense apply mm-hmm. it to the real world you will I, no matter whether you do it from the far left from the far right from in between like Francis Fukuyama if you apply Hegel to history you get complete gibberish I know of no system of thought 
less likely to give you correct answers. And so, um, and this this is a great example. This this whole notion that history is this is this process whereby something unfolds in time and then settles down to a nice stable situation and squats there. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. It didn't. It you know. Uh, Hegel himself thought that, um, thought that I, I forget the exact nature, but he was convinced that history was about to come to an end in his time or shortly thereafter. He was wrong. Everyone else who's thought that way has been wrong, too. Um, and, yeah, the coronavirus is not a thesis. It's not an antithesis. It will seek no synthesis. It's simply, um, I have now forgotten who described history as just one damn thing after another. And that's what coronavirus is, another damn thing. Yeah. Um, I guess in what, what comes to mind to me is is the sort of atomist reading of history. You know, if you have the, the lamb in a plane of everything's flowing straight, everything's flowing straight, everything's going fine, and then you have the uh, the the Klinemann or the Kleinman, which is just that one deviation. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, to put it in sort of horrible materialist terms and scientific terms, which I don't like to do, but all you have to think is that one atom at some point moved within a version of coronavirus, one atom moved in this bat, and someone ate that, and... You know, there was just this tiny, tiny thing, and now it's spiraled into this um, absolute chaos. Um, and then now we now we have a world class mess to deal with. Yeah, exactly. A, yeah, a world a world class mess, which is sort of positive oriented as well. It's sort of feeding itself, unfortunately. And I think, mm-hmm. it's, and also, um, you know, this was going to come much later, but we talk about, um, you know, the end of history. Um, as you know, I'm sort of reminded of of you know not to keep throwing in but i do want to throw in another philosopher who's just not not hegel which is which is Nietzsche, which is you know cyclic history comes back and bites you in the ass you know um <laughs> and 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 as, he, as, Nietzsche would have been delighted with that description I, of his I, philosophy I, yeah. I, I believe i'd like to think so um but uh, you know we're talking about things which are happening again and 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 perhaps you can shed a bit more light on this than me but the the wage injection idea which we're having in the UK the eight, you know we're going to pay 80% of um, laid off workers wages or workers who are going to get laid off we're going to pay 80% of their wages for 3 months maybe more this to me mm-hmm. is pure keens this is 1930 all over again of course it is and and we, we- and and I mean, perhaps you can you can probably articulate it better than me. I, I I can, but 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 you know why won't this work? Well, the the, the question is, what is it trying to do? When when you say will it work, um, it depends on what. The, the point is, they're trying to buy votes, of course. Here in the United States, we're looking at every adult American receiving two checks, uh, each of them for one thousand dollars, just for the, for the the privilege of existing. And so, and again, it's it's a very effective way to buy votes. You want to make people feel like the government is taking care of you, they care about you, da 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 da. And since money at this point is is basically a collective fiction. Um, coming up with the empty billion dollars necessary to do, or the empty billion pounds necessary for the scheme, over over on your side of the pond, um, is is child's play. You just yeah. you, you just tell the computer it has more money. Um, now the question is, what is going to happen when that hits? We don't know yet. The experiment has not been run, and these days I am sufficiently suspicious of all economists of every persuasion. I I have yet. I mean. When you realize how few economists actually make accurate predictions, you are much better off going to an astrologer. What astrologers, will, astrologers will not tell you the sun will rise in the West. Economists say the equivalent all the time. So I don't know what's going to happen when that money starts splashing into the economy. Um, I also don't, don't know what's going to happen. You know, one of the major variables here is how long is the epidemic going to continue? Mm-hmm. If it's a very short-term thing, um, we'll go through. There, there will doubtless be some amount of, of you know, convulsions around the sudden jolt of money in the economy. If it becomes a long-term thing, that can become rather, rather more complex. But we'll, I don't know what's going to happen as a result. Yeah, uh, there was a joke that you and I'm sorry, you and Dmitry Olov or you and James Cunsley used to love to tell, which is I can't remember how it goes. I believe it's uh, what do you call an economist who's who predict? Oh, what do you? Yeah, what do you call an economist who makes a prediction? Oh, I don't and the know. answer is wrong. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> back, back in 2005, 2006, 2007, when um, we had one of the world's 
classic speculative bubbles in real estate over here, and I think generally also. And it was it it, it was it had big signs saying, "Hi, I'm a speculative bubble." All over it, every single box was checked, yeah. and all of the economists were saying, "No, no, no! This is a perfectly reasonable in, in, increase in values." And everybody outside the economics, well, not everybody, but a significant number of people outside the economics profession, were going down point by point and showing, "No, this is a bubble. It's going to blow big time, probably in 2008." As indeed it did. Yeah. <laughs> and so there, there were entire blogs. Um, guy named guy named Keith Brand, I think it was, had a great blog called "Housing Panic." Mm-hmm. And his his tagline was, "Dear God, this is going to end so badly." And he was right. And yet, the economists, the people who, in theory, should have been first to go, mm, that has all the signs of a speculative bubble, they were completely clueless. They mm-hmm. literally, they they could not have been more wrong if they if they had set out with that goal. And so, yeah, what do you call an economist who makes a prediction wrong? It, it works. And and for anyone who sort of wants to watch or read about that that housing bubble in real time uh, the book the big short and the film the big short are both mm-hmm. fantastic on it and there's a brilliant scene in the film which actually i think articulates what we're talking about in terms of assumptions extremely well and um michael burry walks into a, a sort of a housing estate financiers banking office with the big heads and says and says you know i want to short the housing market and they're trying to smirk while he says you know i want two billion to short the housing market and as he walks out they they're sort of belly laughing bending over and and because it's impossible to you know still you still hear people now saying um well if i came into loads of money i'd put it into property property is always good it's an investment <laughs> now now an investment is something that should grow or should have intrinsic value as i understand it exactly. so unless there's water on on your land you haven't got an investment you've got a piece of property and um, an american suburban property especially is is yeah. less than useless Exactly. Exactly. It's it was the whole thing was so crazy. Um, actually, the the other thing that I would recommend our listeners check out is the best book ever written on economic bubble and pop, which is The Great Crash, nineteen twenty nine, by John Kenneth Galbraith. Um, it is the funniest, most gripping, most hilarious, most side splitting work of serious economic history you'll ever encounter. And once you read it, and think about it, you will never be fooled by a speculative bubble again, because they all look the same. Uh, and people act the same way, and they even trot out the same slogans. What are the key, <laughs> what are the key late telltale signs which you believe are, should be so obvious? Oh, yeah, no, the, 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 the flashing red light that means get your money out, stick it under the mattress if you must, is the insistence that not only will the asset class that's at the center of the bubble continue going up forever, but it will continue going up so far and fast that if you don't get in now, you're going to, you're going to miss out on, on becoming rich. Mm-hmm. Once you start getting, uh, the moment people, a significant number of people start saying, you know, there's unlimited upside for this, this, this will only always go up, flee. Yeah. And, um, once they start saying, you better get in now, it, it's going to crash shortly. There was a book published by, uh, I forget the guy's name now, on the, um, uh, who was in, the, in the, the National Association of Realtors, I think it was. And it was all about how you have to get into real estate now or you're, you know, you're going to miss out completely. You'll never be able to own your own house, blah, blah, blah. And I think it came out about three weeks before the bottom fell out. <laughs> now, I, I have some. There, there's there's good historical parallels here because you probably you have probably heard of an American family from Massachusetts named the Kennedys. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh huh. The reason you have heard about the Kennedys is that old Joe Kennedy, um, who was well, let's be polite, he was a member of the Irish the Irish um, criminal underworld. Basically, he made his money his money as a rum runner, um, but he he had made enough money that he had money in stocks and things like that. And in, I think it was 26, 27, something like that, he was getting his shoes shined by a shoeshine boy on Wall Street. And the shoeshine boy offered him a stock tip. Mm -hmm. And old Joe Kennedy thought about that and said, if shoeshine boys are starting to get into the stock market, it is time to get out. He pulled all of his money out of the market that day and stuck it in nice, stable, um, 
unexciting investments, totally unrelated to the subject. And so when the market crashed in 1929, he did not lose one red cent. And all of a sudden, um, old Joe Kennedy was one of the richest men in America, not because he had made all that much money, but because he hadn't lost it all. Yeah. And it's sort of uh, along the, the lines of the Warren the Warren Buffett saying, you know, when there's blood in the streets, that's when you should buy. When everyone else, oh, yeah. when everyone else is um, saying bye, 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 the, your, the chance is already too late. You haven't. Oh, yeah. You haven't yeah, found one, it. Yeah. And the thing is, remember that whatever you are hearing is, is, for, is, is, is promotion. Yeah. It's not it, whatever you hear from a pundit is not in your best interest. They're trying to they're trying they're treating you are the sucker. OK. Mm-hmm. And so, if you do whatever, if if you if you do whatever they're trying to get you not to do, when they're saying you've got to get into the market, that means you need to get out of the market. When they're going, um, <laughs> when they're desperately piling out of the market and saying, "Oh my God, it's going to go down and down and down," then you want to look at at value at good values to buy. Yeah, because it's... you know they're trying to play you for a fool. You don't have to cooperate. Yeah, if you can't spot the. The sucker at a poker table, you are the sucker. Yeah, yes, yes, very much so. Um, but it does, it does, it, it brings to the fore another thing which coronavirus is actually revealing, which is um, what it's done is it's stripped us back to, um, to, 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 to a lesser extent, not, not sort of John Zerzan primitivist run to the woods survival, but the things <laughs> which are still running stably are, mm-hmm. are so it, I find it humorous that. If you look at, say, Italy or on total lockdown, they're saying you can go to um, the pharmacy, you can go to the hospital, doctors, you can go to the shop, and you can go at home. Now, that's that's shelter, food, and health. Mm-hmm. You know, these mm-hmm. are your your survival basics. And mm-hmm. when we're talking about there with houses, we're talking about value. And you suddenly something like this cuts through, you know, all the crap, and you go, here's what has actual mm-hmm. value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of the reasons why I think that the aftermath of this whole oh, whole fandango may actually turn out to be very good for at least those of us who survive, mm-hmm. because this is a real opportunity to to check okay what actually matters. Mm-hmm. Most people in industrial society today spend most of their time on stuff that does not matter to the squat. It doesn't even matter to them. They're doing it because it's fashionable. They're doing it because the media tells them to. They're doing it because they have it. They're, media be- they're doing it because they simply didn't think enough not to. But mm-hmm. now all of a sudden, there's a lot of people who are sitting at home. And these various occupations that have filled their days and nights are close to them. And I've been hearing people, on the one hand, people saying, wow, it's so quiet and so pleasant, and I'm actually feeling so relaxed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, the doom of, of whole sectors of the consumer economy is written in those words. But I'm also hearing from people who are really stopping and thinking and saying, okay, when this is over, what do I actually want to do? Mm-hmm. So again, individuals, the, the herd will continue uh, stampeding off the cliff, which is the, the basic shape of human history. But individuals can learn. Individuals can wake up, look at what they're doing, look at the way they're living their lives, and decide if they really want to go back to doing the kind of particular round they were doing in the past. Mm-hmm. So there can be advantages to this kind of thing. I, I, I knew some people, this was a few years ago, of course, I knew some people who, who well remembered life during the Second World War when you had a lot of rationing. Here, of course, we didn't have bombs falling, but um, we had a, there was a lot of rationing. There were a lot of things you simply could not get. Um, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of limitations that mm-hmm. people had to deal with. And everyone... I knew who went through that said, you know, we actually learned a whole lot by going through that experience. Mm-hmm. It actually, you know, it, we, when, when the war was over and, and, all, and the troops came home and we finished partying and finished drinking ourselves blind drunk to celebrate the defeat of the, of the Axis, um, things were different for a while. Things, people, were, people were a little less prone to do certain kinds of certain kinds of stupid things. So I have hopes that this might help at least for a little while. Um, this actually reminds me of a section from, I'm sure you've read it, and I don't think I've seen you comment on it, which is strange, and uh, I've always wondered about this, but it reminds me of a section from um, Industrial Society and in Its Future by uh, Kaczynski, or Kaczynski. Uh, I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm sure, I'm, I'm assuming you've, you have 
read this. Actually, somewhere. actually, I have not. That 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 does not ring any bells. So uh, tell me about this book. T- uh, Ted, Ted Kaczynski, the, the oh 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 the, the Unabomber, Unabomber guy. Yeah, Unabomber. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. The uh, the essay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, I have read that. Although it's been a while. Mm-hmm. So uh, just just gonna say I don't. <laughs> obviously don't agree with what he did but the the manifesto itself uh which is sort of an anti-tech l- pro luddite mm-hmm. uh essay for anyone who doesn't know uh it's interesting it is well written he was a smart guy but he also was mm-hmm. a uh sociopath and a terrorist and a murderer uh but anyway there is a point in it where he start he begins to discuss what we're discussing here which is surrogate activities and once mm-hmm. you remove the once you remove survival, you know, when a human is without the, shall we say, the life support system of modernity for mm-hmm. for its meaning, you know, when your your day is starting, you go, well, if I don't do this, I won't have food and I will die. There is no question mm-hmm. of the meaning of your existence. But once those <laughs> things are spoon, literally spoon fed to you, and I've said this before, that in many Western countries, you could literally lay down and do nothing and you still wouldn't die because you'd be picked up and taken somewhere where they would not allow you to die you know your survival Mm -hmm. is you you are an infant um Mm -hmm. so once all your survival your food your water your shelter is all catered for um kaczynski makes this point of saying well you begin to put your meaning onto surrogate activities now what corona has done is removed this sort of veil and you go well Mm -hmm. here's here's this this you know you can now see the crap that i've been finding Mm -hmm. meaning Mm in uh Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what you'd make of that. Yeah, no, I think that one of the one of the irritating things about certain class of social critics is that they're really good at explaining what's wrong with the current situation system and really bad about suggesting what to do about it. <laughs> Kaczynski is a great example. Yeah. Some of the points he made in his manifesto are actually quite good, um, but his approach to dealing with it is is crazed, mm-hmm. <laughs> to put it lightly. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, the the. It's when people uh, when people don't have to deal with realities, with the reality of being fed, with the reality of you know the making making life for themselves, that yeah they redirect everything towards toward these surrogate activities, and many of them, many of these activities are to any outside view really rather strange, <laughs> which is fine. I mean we're we're, we're like most social primates, we're rather creative and we get into, we do funny things. But um, there's also, of course, the fact that we've got an entire economy, the, the entire consumer sector of the economy depends on making people take on new surrogates and pay for it and pay for the privilege. Mm-hmm. So you have people who invest their identity in um, a sports team. And of course, they have to pay this and buy that, and, and so on and so forth. Or they invest their identity in in this, you know, some kind of internet activity, or in a movie star, or in the, it's, all of these bizarre things. And there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of, of propaganda. There's a lot of manipulative stuff that's that's intended to encourage people to waste their lives that way because that's very profitable for the industries that, that benefit from it. And here again. The, the current situation is making that there, there's there's that gap now. I mean, in some cases, people could still go online and play World of Warcraft or whatever it is. But a lot of those surrogate activities have been shut down. Nobody's going to, to you know, sports games at this point. And bit by bit, I think it's starting to sink in that um, well, for some people that, well, maybe that wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. Mm-hmm. Sort of the, the small cartoon I've seen on line before which says uh, it's a picture of two people just kind of farming a small allotment and it says and and one of them is saying um yeah we've got everything we need and uh, we're very content and happy and below it, it just says capitalism's worst enemy uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes very much so yeah and the thing is it 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 is not necessary for an economy to to work that way we've managed to create one collectively that does and of course it's very poorly suited to the era of of economic contraction that we're, that we're moving deeper into at this point and so um i think one of the things that that 
one of the great tasks we face is figuring out how to provide how to how to meet our economic needs in a way that doesn't provide so much room for so many sources of distraction, so many sources of of um, so many ways that people can can manipulate us to um, to soak up our money and pretend that they're giving us meaning in return. Mm-hmm. It's uh, sort of put very um, very articulately the other day. Someone said that uh, it, the economy doesn't produce the thing you desire; it produces the desire itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's sort of like we we discussed, uh, I believe, in the first interview about the the dancing Santa Claus you get at Christmas. Spend ten seconds thinking about the things you're doing. Uh, why you're doing, where that mm-hmm. desire came from, and you usually mm-hmm. can never find an origin. Yeah, yeah, because because you're not looking in the right place, because the origin is not in you. Mm-hmm. The desire is being created in you by an advertising campaign. And so, yeah, this here we start getting into, I mean, it's, it's, it's really difficult to talk about this sort of thing without using terms like sorcery, mm-hmm. without using mm-hmm. terms like spell and trance. Mm-hmm. And, and um, Ioan Coliano, the, the brilliant Romanian-American uh, scholar mm-hmm. um, who, who wrote um, Eros and Magic of the Renaissance some decades back, um, he, he was very clear on this. He points out that modern advertising is a, is a, form, a debased form of magic. It's a way of, to borrow Dion Fortune's definition of magic, causing change in consciences in accordance with will. Of course, your conscience is being changed, but it's not your will that's changing. It's the, it's the guy who's paying for the ad. So one of the things that, that all of this points to is the need for us to, um, to decolonize our own imaginations, to take our imaginations, our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, and take control over them and instead of leaving them in the hands of a bunch of advertisers. Mm-hmm. And I think anyone who's, which I imagine, you know, unfortunately a lot of people are going to be, anyone who's not sympathetic to the occult or magic framework of this is, you can put it in materialist terms of, um, I think it was David Foster Wallace who said that an, an advert creates an anxiety which is relievable by purchase. And what mm-hmm. you need to do is assess what are you anxious about? Is it because you don't, you know, I'm not going to have this fast car. Are you anxious that, uh, you know, you're not going to have the status? Well, why do you want the status? Um, mm-hmm. And then you'll you'll answer that and you go, well, why do you feel like you need that, etc., etc. Et and eventually you'll get to mm-hmm. the, the, the point that no, so this is all sort of free-floating and is held together by its own justification Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you can take it the other way and go well will buying this product actually give what you know provide the service that it's supposed to and the answer is always no no because a satisfied customer doesn't keep shopping and so if you look you know you here we have a beer ad okay and there's a i don't i don't know what your beer ads are like over here or over there over here your typical beer ad has a bunch of people having a mix men and women together of course Mm -hmm. um and the, the women are always, at least one of the women is looking adoringly at one of the men. It's, it's really quite tacky. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, they're, they're raising glasses of beer, and they're all fashionable, and they're all young, and they're all pretty. And look at that with a jaundiced eye as it sits there on the billboard and go, for real? No. No. <laughs> no. You are not going to experience this by buying, um, a, bo- you know, buying a bottle of cheap yellow beer because it's almost always the cheap yellow beer that's being advertised that way mm-hmm. you know this <laughs> you are not going to have that experience you're going to sit there and drink this this fizzy yellow substance that uh, you know you just want to speculate which uh, what the what creature's bladder produced it <laughs> if you want to but um <laughs> but you know you're going to sit there drinking this stuff and you're going to have exactly the same kind of social life that you had when you weren't drinking this stuff mm-hmm. There isn't. It is not a ma- the, you know the cheap yellow beer is not a magic talisman that will make you young and pretty and fashionable and get girls to engage at you adoringly. Um, and once you start looking at ads that way and taking them apart and saying, okay, what what manipulation is that one trying? It becomes kind of funny. Mm-hmm. But then once you begin to draw that back to uh, you know as far as back as you can go with that, you begin to question, well, why did I ever need, let's say, uh, the, the, you know, the desire for some form of social, social status in, in the first place? And that's when I believe you begin to target yourself towards a more uh, very troubled word, but authentic form of, mm-hmm. of self. 
Um, mm-hmm. But but one thing I would just comment there is um, the the consumer has become sort of sadomasochistic because a lot of advertising now is sort of uh, kitchen sink realism and, and ironic and it would sort of actually give you the the brutal you know reality of what it's actually like and but instead of consumers feeling that they're mocked they'll sort of laugh and say oh that's you know that's me that's what I do um, and I think to that extent that a sort of you know the the modern beer ad I mean, we don't have too many in this country now but I think the modern beer ad which, you know should be a sort of balding middle-aged phone salesman on a Saturday night sat on his own just watching mm-hmm. soaps and I think you know perhaps that would still yeah. sell unfortunately uh, <laughs> I think it was Leo, Leotard who said that the working class love the pain and strife of working they you know, they adore it they sort of uh, they revel in, in the idea that they're suffering I think um, not sure I agree, I, but there I, you go. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure he's right. I think I sometimes suspect that he didn't spend a lot of time talking to working class people. Are you you, um, suspe- it, it, you it, suspect it, that a uh, upper middle class French philosopher didn't spend much time with a working class? Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 don't think, I don't think he spent enough time in, in working class bars or the equivalent uh, just listening to the talk and find uh, this is uh, of course that's that's the pervasive problem with a lot of the leftward end of politics they're full of talk about the sufferings Demi, of the working Demi. poor and all this kind of stuff and it's all written by people who have never skipped a meal in their lives and who are the beneficiaries of the system that they claim to be opposed to and of course that and you end up with all kinds of strange paradoxes coming out of that Mm. And, and what? Yeah, and 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 it's sort of the the etiquette, the cleanliness, and the professionalism of the of the left, which mm-hmm. always bemuses me in terms of, you know, I grew up around a lot of working class mm-hmm. people, and uh, I don't want you know these are people I get on with, so and I know that their humour is one of pure banter and self-depreciation. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't mm-hmm. mind me saying this, but the stereotypes are true. And mm-hmm. when you when you hear a left, left-wing sort of, I'm thinking of Owen Jones in the UK, talk about supporting the working class, I, I just want to say to him, you need to walk into a sort of rural town drinker's boozer on a Saturday night around 11 p.m. and and see if these are the people talking about um, Marxist labor, you know, va- uh, labor value and species <laughs> being. You know, mention that to them, and either you're going to get chucked out or you're going to get knocked out. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, it's it, it's it's ridiculous, but it's also it's a source of it's a source of great amusement, and it's also unfortunately a source of severe vulnerability on the to the left because what we've seen here in the United States. In the in the era of Trump, um, is that Trump is actually addressing the working class, talking uh, talking about the issues that concern the working class, and doing a fairly good job of of um, winning support from that source. Whereas the left is now sort of flailing because they, the 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 working class is supposed to follow us, and so we have you have all of these clean cut corporate airbrushed uh, you know, middle management types who are doing studies to explain to try to explain the bizarre fact that when when Trump says something that offends the comfortable and privileged the working class aren't aren't offended mm-hmm. uh, there were, during during the run-up to the 2016 election there was this amazingly funny situation they did this study with a bunch of Trump voters they got a bunch of Trump voters and they showed them a a video, an advertisement that was meant to convince them not to vote for Trump. Mm-hmm. And they tested him before and afterwards on their approval on how they, what they thought of Trump. And nearly every one of them, after watching this video, was even more <laughs> strong in their support of Trump. And all of the, the, the talking heads were going, this is just totally bizarre. Is it some kind of weird mental problem? Well, no. The video was made by corporate by upper middle class talking heads, mm-hmm. four upper middle class talking mm-hmm. heads, talking in the same terms that the working class has had has had to deal with for all these years. They know you're lying. Yeah, yeah. Your and lips if, are moving. And, it, yeah. <laughs> and if I know the word, so, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, and so, but 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 it still goes. It, it, the the people in the suits cannot apparently grasp the fact that 
an enormous number of working class Americans see through them. Mm -hmm. Don't believe what they say. Distrust them. Recognize that they're speaking out of class privilege, not out of their great, you know, their their much vaunted sympathy for the working class and blah 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 blah. Um, so it's, it's been hilarious to yeah. watch. Well, th this because is because it's the whole thing. As the whole thing cracks down the middle. Well, this is was your comments on Brexit as well, which which I sort of can condense down to, uh, in my opinion here that everything. The, the the everything that is wrong as as far as the left see it isn't the sincere and genuine opinion of the person who voted it's a fault in their thinking you know no everyone on the left anyone who anyone who votes conservative in the uk to people on the left that isn't their sincere opinion they don't actually really, actually believe jacob Rees mogg or boris johnson that's a fault in their thinking which needs to be fixed same with mm -hmm. brexit and of course mm -hmm. their tactic to when you said well i'm a i'm a lever or a brexiteer was you're a fascist and a bigot mm -hmm. and all that all that did was make those voters go silent but unfortunately when you're inside the voting booth you no longer have to be silent and that was the you know, first exactly. i'm in complete agreement with you i've watched listen to your interview that was the first truly working class vote that has ever happened in the uk since about mm -hmm. 19 the late 80s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it, just watching the run-up to the brexit vote it was it was very parallel to watching the run-up to trump's first uh, to fr trump's election in 2016 mm -hmm. all of the pundits trotting out a set of canned uh, of, of canned talking points that were completely detached from the reality that most people lived in uh, and they were they were it was all focused within an echo chamber within an, within a, an echo chamber of comfort and privilege and nobody nobody addressed the concerns of the majority of the voters mm -hmm. it was it was frankly eerie and then when when the when the brexit vote went the way it did the constant well, that can't have happened. Well, you know, we, we, we have to do it again. <laughs> Maybe they'll get it right this time. <laughs> the, the, the total unwillingness to grasp the fact that a great many million British subjects looked at the, what was being offered them and said, no, we want our country back. And, and had good reasons to do so. And the fact they're, they're still not getting it. And of course, that's, what, that's why um, Johnson was able to stomp the opposition in this, in this last election you had. Um, everyone else was talking about the stuff that appealed within, the, within their echo chambers. Mm -hmm. um, Johnson, Johnson took things straight to the voters, straight to the working class voters, and knew perfectly well that if, if he did so, he could break the red wall. Yeah. In the Midlands and the North, yeah. as indeed he did, mm -hmm. and, and overturn the, the the established certainties of British politics. And I don't think I don't think the the, the, the Labour has yet grasped what happened. No, no, they haven't. They, La Labour aren't Labour in terms of what that name actually historically no. means. They're an affluent liberal sort of uh -huh. university party. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, 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 and people vote for them for the sake of every policy we have is targeted at uh, you know good cause or some virtue or you know instead mm -hmm. of instead of well who's going to fix the potholes you know who's going to yeah these things aren't addressed anymore that's the frustrations for the working class yeah exactly and so to the extent that the conservatives can reorient themselves to become a party that has something to offer the working class labor may find itself out in the cold for a good long time mm -hmm. in the same way we're we're facing a similar shift here although it's a rather more ragged process um, we don't have the we don't have the neat and the, the neatly ordered structure of, of parliamentary government. We have a more ramshackle structure, but but it's happening here as well, um, as the as the sort of working class populism takes off and aligns around the around uh, uh, Trump and his various supporters. Mm -hmm. There's there's a real sea change going on here, and a lot of the old line Democrats who who assume as a matter of course that, for example, African American voters will necessarily vote Democrat are facing a shattering surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a there's a fantastic article by Curtis Yarvin, which is sort of mm -hmm. in short saying that, back to coronavirus, uh, that coronavirus is, is, is probably the kind of the first death blow in many to globalism. Now, and mm -hmm. what it's doing, you know, 
prior to this, we had four years of uh, the beginnings of nationalism again. We had mm-hmm. Trump, Le Pen gaining support, AFD mm-hmm. in Germany gaining support, mm-hmm. Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, mm-hmm. to a lesser extent, um, Farage, Mogg and Johnson in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, and, a, and a few more elsewhere, I believe Italy as well was going towards the nationalist thing. And you're seeing mm-hmm. what the left at least consider right wing parties um, bring up. But, but the but the interesting thing, which I think Corona has brought along, and this is sort of a dark joke, is that it's ramp, ramped up the the need for borders and immigration checks and mm-hmm. sort of said, look, globalism isn't really working. And there's other reasons for that, which are now coming out of the woodwork. It's making us swallow mm-hmm. a lot of truths, which we just didn't want to admit because we had this amazing system. So it's ramping up nationalism. But at the same time, it's promoting really aggressive socialist economic strategies. Mm-hmm. And someone made the jo- dark joke of saying, Unfortunately, history does have a compromise for you there. <laughs> yes, and that's the, I'm sure that will be on many people's minds. The, the thing to keep in mind is that that particular compromised party with its, with its armbands and jackboots mm-hmm. was not the first to call itself National Socialist. Mm-hmm. There were yeah, national people socialist always forget parties. as well. People always forget they, yeah. they get called fascists, yeah. but you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, there were national socialist parties in several European countries by 1900. Mm-hmm. It was a known rep- it was a known attitude within the range of, of possibilities, and and the fact that that Hitler happened to take that moniker as in in his attempt to. Um, to kind of uh, take over the the excluded middle in in uh, German politics in the 1930s, 1920s and 1930s, is is kind of unfortunate because it's made it difficult to talk about the the way that many countries actually have gone toward a sort of mixed economy, mm-hmm. where you have on the one hand um, a lot of economic activity left to the free market, on the other hand a lot of government regulation and uh, social safety net measures, mm-hmm. which is more or less what that what that combination comes down to. Yeah. So, uh, as, as Orloff says, socialism with market elements, you know. Um, uh, it, or um, mar- a market economy with socialist elements. Yeah, yeah, either way. So, it, yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is, that, that sort of mixed economy, um, it, it irritates the stuffing out of economists, <laughs> which yeah. is a good thing right there. And it also causes a lot of irate, um, irate feelings among the, the more ideologically minded on all sides, because it's not pure this and it's not pure that, it's not pure the other thing. But it works better than many of the alternatives. Mm-hmm. And so, especially in times of crisis, I mean, look at what happened during, again, the Second World War is a great example. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in Britain, in America, in every country, every serious combatant country, you had a lot of government programs for, I mean, the, you, had a, you, you had a ministry of food. We have, we have a, a collection of recipes from the, the cookbook flyers that were circulated around from the ministry of food, how to make use of you know, these, these um, sometimes unappetizing things that were what was available. Mm-hmm. And so... There was a lot of that, and there tends to be a lot of that in in a situation of emergency. The the challenge is going to be to see how much of it goes away as soon as the when, when the virus does. Yeah. So do you, do you think that uh, as the virus dissipates, we're going to people people who were sort of reluctantly wanting globalism to go away are just going to keep quiet and sort of hope? Do you think do you think coronavirus has dealt a uh, early death blow to the the global society, the global economy, like as a mm-hmm. connected? Oh, yeah. Well, the global economy was already in deep trouble. Um, once the, one of the major axes of it was the, was the arrangement between the United States and China, where the U.S. takes, uh, takes China's consumer products and we take them in paper. Uh, and a lot of that, that, that is already collapsing as, um, as, you know, with, with Trump's tariffs. Mm-hmm. And generally, the way that he has been um, imposing sensible tariffs on global trade, the whole system is coming unglued because the, the the linchpin of that system was the United States as the consumer of last resort, the country that would take anything. Um, we're not doing that anymore. And so it was already in deep trouble. And I think the coronavirus is going to prove to be a major blow because 
Um, on the one hand, we've seen what the problems are here in the United States, for example, with having much of our medical uh, technology and, and gear and supplies made in China. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the Chinese are not necessarily sending them. So um, there, there has, in fact, been an executive order issued just recently to, um, to move more of that production back to the United States. Mm-hmm. There will be more. Yeah, I believe Musk, and, uh, Musk jumped on that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so there's, there's all this stuff that, um, all of these things that, that I think will be, lasting, will be lasting changes, simply because people are looking at the situation and saying, no, we need to go, this, this, this is a downside we, we don't need. And I expect to see um, less opposition to um, border checks. Um, less support for illegal immigration mm-hmm. um, in the aftermath of this. Yeah, these were the, these were the, you know increased. Uh, this is what I had written down: kind of increased distrust in sort of hegemonic, you know, EU type mm-hmm. government things, and a, and a sort of a rally cry for traditionally right wing um, mm-hmm. strategies. You know, I think yeah, I, I think I, any yeah. smart uh, right leaning politician right now could find it very easy means to attune mm-hmm. this to mm-hmm. their aims extremely mm-hmm. easy means and i believe dominic right. dominic cummings i mean i don't want to say if he's right leaning but i believe johnson and and cummings will you know oh. use, use this and already are using this to their i to say to, to 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 use to use an american figure of speech they'll be all over that like ugly on an ape <laughs> 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 yeah um this this sort of thing, especially because the the EU's own response to the situation was so clumsy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so fixated on no, you know, um, avoiding any appearance of racism is more important than people's lives. Yeah, and that that if you if they had wanted to play into the hands of AFD and the other populist nationalist parties, they could not have done a better job. Mm-hmm. And it. it it is not in, it is not impossible that the entire Schengen arrangement, the open border arrangement, will not survive this. Mm-hmm. Do you and, do you think it's brought any other key issues into sight? This, this other than the thing, the ones we've mentioned. I I don't know yet. I, basically, a lot a lot is going to depend on what happens with the conversations from here on, and especially as effective treatments and vaccines start being start start hitting the hitting the big time as i expect will happen quite soon um especially as the pressure starts going away what do people start talking about so at the moment it's still very much in the reactive phase people are just going uh, 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 and, and freaking out a little bit mm-hmm. or just settling down at home or what have you but as the pressure starts lifting watch what they talk about that will give you early warning of what the big trends are going to be over the next few mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. Um, and has it revealed or has anything happened because of it which has surprised you um, I am a little surprised that I've heard from so many people who are who, who seem to be dealing with it and using it to shake themselves awake. I'm just, I'm very pleased, but the number of people who've been talking intelligently about "Wow, I should have had more food stashed," or mm-hmm. "Wow, this, this and that and the other is really crazy," or you know, I'm really liking just spending an evening at home. Yeah. It's it's having a much more positive reaction than I ever thought it would. And um, so that that was that was a surprise. The rest of it was pretty predictable, and especially the alternation between "Oh no, it's nothing!" Ah, panic, panic, panic. <laughs> the classic. Yeah, on the part of governments and everything else. That's it's always the usual. always best to panic early. Mm-hmm. Um, and as someone who sort of you know studied these things and written about these things, uh, obviously one of the things that I've been stating that which people. Uh, some people online have got a bit annoyed me about, which is sort of the once again on the prepping mentality, is people saying, "Well, we'll just begin to grow crops, and yeah, you can grow some some crops quite quickly and easily, lettuces, tomatoes." But in terms of substantial, you know, mm-hmm. there's a learning curve, and people always seem to forget the, mm-hmm. should we say, the meta part of you know, it's not as it's, oh, yeah. it's not as simple as just planting seeds. So, would you have any sort of, you know, this isn't the end. It's part of a larger process of collapse. Um, mm-hmm. It's a little hurdle which might actually sort of level the West out for mm-hmm. a little bit. But you've got any mm-hmm. sort of practical advice for individuals right now? Um, well, 
I would, I would encourage all the people who say, well, we can plant crops to try it. Because the way they'll learn that there's a learning curve is by sticking those seeds in the ground and then discovering it's not that easy. So I would, I would encourage all of our, all of our listeners, as the uh, in the in the northern hemisphere, as the spring as spring comes on and it's time to plant seeds, go plant some seeds. Uh, get a good get a, a book or two on gardening and learn how to learn start learning how to do it. You will not learn it all at once. It is not the simplest thing. You know, uh, Michael Bloomberg, our, our temporary presidential candidate over here, was uh, was quoted as talking about how, uh, you know, farming is just is just st- stupid easy. You just stick the seed in the ground and up it comes, proving that he's never tried it. Mm-hmm. And um, also, also guaranteeing his loss of the nomination, but that's another point entirely. But yeah, the thing is, this is the time to start looking at what you can do to get to be better prepared for the next crisis, because there will be a next crisis. Mm-hmm. We are, mm-hmm. Industrial civilization is on the downslope of its history. The next one may not be an epidemic. It may be um, ec- economic trouble. It may be a war that causes um, supply chains to disrupt. It could be any number of things. But there will be a next crisis, and the question is, what are you going to do about it? Now that you know some of your vulnerabilities, now that you've experienced where the limits are, where the lines are, what you have and what you don't have, you actually have some really valuable information that you can use to say, okay, I need to clear out you know, this, this cupboard um, that I have full of stuff that I never use, and I'm going to use it to put, to put up rice, you know, bags of rice and other things that, that, that I can rotate into my food supply and keep replacing so that I have a couple of weeks of food. At least I can make rice and beans or what have you. Um, you know, or why don't I try doing the garden thing this spring? Mm-hmm. Give it a try. Start learning that process. Or what have you. Uh, you know, each, each person will have, a, will have encountered and experienced different things over the course of the, of, of the epidemic. And so it's a matter of, okay, what lessons are you going to draw from, from that? This is, this is not an anomaly. This is actually a return to history as usual. And we will have more things like this as we go. So learn from it. Hit the ground running. uh Draw some conclusions. Go ahead. That's what I was going to say is, you know, not great advice, but we're telling the herd to learn from history, which uh, (laughs) is always... Mm -hmm. always... Well, no, no, I'm not. I'm not telling the herd to learn from history. I'm telling individuals to learn from history. The herd will do what the herd always does. But each pair of ears listening to this podcast belongs to an individual human being. And those individuals can learn from history. Mm-hmm. Will they? That depends on that depends on them. But they have the capacity. It can happen. I've, I've actually seen it with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is there uh, anything else you'd, you'd like to add? Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people may be surprised by, I am expecting this whole thing to end a lot sooner than the media is suggesting. Mm-hmm. Um, on the one hand, there are there are a number of vaccines already in the testing phase. It's mm-hmm. it's a single virus. It's not that difficult. I mean, making making vaccines is one of the things that our, our medical industry is fairly good at in the in the industrial world. So there are vaccines currently in test. There's also been some very promising news with um, an old an old malaria vaccine of all things that seems to affect this um, uh, chloroquine seems to affect this virus very powerfully. There have been some favorable tests. There are more tests currently underway. It is quite possible that by, um, the, by the end of April, all of this is going to be over. Lovely. So, now, we'll see. It, it, that may not happen, but there is a very real chance that that may happen, and be ready for that. Mm-hmm. Don't assume that this is going to go on, drag on as long as the media wants you to think. Mm-hmm. So beyond that, I don't know, just um, I would encourage people to learn from their experience, um, enjoy their time off, and um, laugh at the vagaries of the, the people who are trying to sh- spin the news one way or the other. Okay. Um, and I imagine this will bring quite a few new listeners to, uh, to the podcast and to you. So is there anything you would like to direct them towards of yours? I mean, I would say, if you're interested in Collapse, read Dark Age America and Collapse mm-hmm. Now and Avoid the Rush by John Michael Gray. Mm-hmm. 
th- those 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 would certainly be good places to start. Um, and in terms, I, I'm not doing a lot on collapse these days. I, I wrote um, everything I could think of to write about that back in the days of the Archdrude Report, mm-hmm. and I have a number of books on that subject. Um, the Long Descent still remains, I think, a, a good introduction to that. Mm-hmm. Um, these days, my my work has been heading in other directions, but that's fine. Um, those who are interested in seeing where I'm going now, um, e- uh, e- www.ecosophia, E-C-O-S-O-P-H-A-A.net, um, is my blog. And, you know, my books are available at, at um, cheap bookstores everywhere. <laughs> okay. John Michael Gray, thanks once again for coming on Emetics. And Thank you.